from a black one. So, when they reached the well, he let his mare drink her fill, and he took off the saddle and bridle and let her loose, after which he sat down with his head in the shade of a gata bush to rest himself. Allah is merciful, he said. The night will come, and then I will drink, for he dared not ride farther for fear of not finding water again. Then again he was disturbed, for he had nothing to eat, and he thought that if he waited until night, he would be hungry as well as thirsty, but presently he saw the mare trying to catch the locust that flew about. She could only catch one or two, because it was now hot, and they were able to fly quickly. When the night comes, he said, the locust will lie on the ground and cling to the bushes, being stiff with the cold, and then I will eat my fill and drink also. Soon afterwards he fell asleep, being weary, and when he awoke it was night again, and the stars shone overhead. Khalid rose hastily and drank at the well, and made ablutions and prayed, prostrating himself towards the Qibla. He remembered that he had slept a long time, and that he had not performed his devotions for a day and a night, so that he repeated them five times to atone for the omission. The mare was eating the locust that now lay in great black patches on the sand unable to move and save themselves. Khalid threw his cloak over a great number of them and gathered them together. Then he kindled a fire of Gara by striking sparks from the blade of his sword, and when he had made a bed of coals, he roasted the locust after pulling off their legs and ate his fill. While he was doing this, he was much disturbed in mind. I have only just begun to live as a man, he thought. Did I not stand ten months and thirteen days in the third heaven, unconscious of the passing of time? Who shall tell me whether I have not slept another ten months or more under this bush, like the companions of Al-Rakim? So, when he had done eating and had drunk again from the well, and had made the mare drink, he saddled her quickly and mounted, and cantered on through the night, guiding his course by the stars. On the following day he again found a well, but much later than before, and he suffered much from thirst, as he watched his mare dip her black lips into the pool. Nevertheless, he would not break his fast, for he was resolved to be a true believer in practice as well as in belief. So he fell asleep and awoke when it was night again and ate and drank. In this way he journeyed several days until he began to see the hill country which borders the desert towards Riyadh and he understood that he had been much farther away than he had imagined. But he reflected that Allah had doubtless intended to try his constancy by imposing upon him the journey through the desert during the days of fasting. But at last, he awoke one day just at sunset instead of sleeping until the night. He had been traveling up the first slopes where the ground, though barren, is harder than in the desert and had lain down in a hollow by an abundant spring. He rose now, and made ablutions and prayed, as usual, towards Mecca. That is to say, being where he was, he turned his face to the west as the sun was setting. When he had finished, he stood some minutes watching the red light over the desert below him, and then he was suddenly aware that the new moon was hanging just above the diminishing fire of the evening, and he knew that the fast of Ramadan was over, and that the feast of Bayram had begun. Thereat he was glad, 
and determined to take an unusual number of locusts for his evening meal. But when he looked about, he saw that there were no locusts in the place, though there was grass, which his mare was eating. Then he looked everywhere near the well to see whether some traveler had not perhaps dropped a few dates or a little barley by accident. But there was nothing. Doubtless, he said, Allah wishes to show me that greediness is a sin, even on the day of feasting. He drank as much of the water as he could in order to stay his hunger, as well as assuage his thirst. And then he saddled the mare, and rode up out of the hollow towards the hill country. Towards the middle of the night, he came to a small village where all the people were celebrating the feast, having killed a young camel and several sheep. Seeing that he was a traveler, they bade him welcome, and he sat down among them and ate his fill of meat, praising Allah. And corn was given to his mare, so that the dumb animal also kept the feast. Truly, said the people, thy mare is a daughter of El Barak, the heavenly steed called the lightning, upon which the nocturnal journey was accomplished by the prophet, upon whom be peace. They said this not because they divined that the mare had been given to Khalid by an angel, but because they saw by her beauty that she must be swift as the wind. For she had a large head with bony cheeks and a full forehead and round black eyes wide apart, with smooth black skin about them and a pointed nose, and the under lip was like that of a camel, projecting a little. And she was neither too long nor too short, having straight legs like steel, and small feet and round hoofs, neither overgrown in idleness nor overworn with much work. And her tail lay flat and long and smooth when she was standing still, but arched like the plume of an ostrich when she moved. Her coat was bright bay, glossy and smooth, and without any white markings. By all these signs, which belonged to the purest blood, the people of the village knew that she was of the fleetest reared in Arabia. And Khalid was glad that the people admired her, since she was the chief of his few possessions, which indeed were not many. He did not know beforehand what he should do, nor what he should say when in the presence of the Sultan of Najed, still less how he could venture to ask Zahoa in marriage, having no gift to offer, and not himself being a prince. Before he had become a man, it would have been easy for him to find treasures in the earth such as men had never seen, for, like all the genii, he had been acquainted with the most deeply hidden mines and with all places where men had hidden wealth in old times. But this knowledge does not belong to the intelligence becoming mortals, but rather of the faculty of seeing through solid substance, which is exercised by the spirits of the air. And in his present state, it was taken from him, together with all possibility of communicating with his former companions. He had nothing but his mare and his sword and the garments he wore, and though the mare was indeed a gift for a king, he did not know whether he was meant to offer it to anyone, seeing that it had been given him by an angel. Nevertheless, he did not lose heart, for the celestial messenger had told him that by the will of Allah he should marry Zahoa, and Allah was certainly able to give him a king's daughter in marriage without the aid of gifts, of gold, of musk, of oud, of aloes, or of pearls. He rose, therefore, when he had eaten enough and had rested himself and his mare, 
and after thanking the people of the village for their entertainment, he rode on his way. He passed through a hill country, sometimes fertile and sometimes stony and deserted, but he found water by the way, and such food as he needed, and accomplished the remainder of the journey without hindrance. On the morning of the second day, he came to a halting place from which he could see the city of Riyadh, and he was astonished at the size and magnificence of the Sultan's palace, which was visible above the walls of the fortification. Yet he was aware that he had seen all this before, as in a dream, not altogether forgotten, when a man wakes at dawn after a long and restless night. He gazed a while, after he had made his ablutions, and then, calling to his mare to come to him, he mounted and rode through the southern gate into the heart of the city. End of chapter 1 Read by Angelique G. Campbell December 2018